Welcome to Startup Health TV, I'm Logan Plaster. Today I get to sit down and talk with Brandy Harless and Dr. Natalie Davis, the duo behind Prevent Scripts. Uh, this company was founded in Kentucky and which joined Startup Health in 2014. Uh, it gives primary care clinicians, doctors and nurses, the digital tools they need to fight preventable chronic diseases like di diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. It's a very provider first approach, uh, which makes sense since Dr. Davis has been a practicing pediatrician for more than two decades. Uh, it integrates seamlessly into their workflow uh, at the doctor's office, but it also meets patients where they're at, helping them to modify and change behaviors that are keeping them from living a healthy life. Uh, in our interview, we unpack the product they've built and their greater health moonshot. Hope you enjoy. All right, Brandy Harless, Natalie Davis from Prevent Scripts. I am excited to have you on this show and learn more about what you're building. So thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. So Brandy, why don't we start with you? Um, I want you to just walk me through uh, the Prevent Scripts product. I mean, we'll, we'll get into sort of your background and your passion uh, and what uh, you're working on now, but just start by giving our audience a, a flyover of what Prevent Scripts is. Absolutely. So we like to say that we are on a mission to empower primary care providers to be on the front lines of defense against preventable diseases, uh, things like diabetes, hypertension, obesity. Um, we have created what we have called now, and we'd love to talk about that with you a little bit too, um, a tech-enabled digital service line. So this idea that we want to help our primary care customers fully embed um, this service into their practice so that they can be targeting those patients that may not quite have disease yet, uh, but might be coming up on disease onset, or maybe we can prevent disease altogether, and that's the ultimate goal. Now, Dr. Davis, you're a practicing physician. Um, what was it about this pain point for the physician specifically that, that really spoke to you? What was difficult for me, Logan, in practice, and I'm a, I'm a, t a career pediatrician, 20 years in the, in the outpatient clinic trenches, was... Um, my utter inability to actually change patients' behavior. I could tell them what to do. I could see them using consumer apps that really were helping them. But as a provider, I wasn't providing that value. Mm -hmm. And so I became um, really uh, interested in this idea that providers can go beyond telling patients what to do handing them handouts on their way out the door and then seeing them back in the year only to have as soon as patients leave your office. Yeah. Brandy, can you put the scope of this problem in perspective? Because as you said that, Dr. Davis, I'm just thinking of just the vast number of people who would apply to that scenario. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we know that over half of our population um, are obese, and this is becoming an epidemic um, in the United States, we all know. We also know that there's about 80 million people walking around with prediabetes, to which probably 30 to 40% don't even know um, that they have prediabetes. Uh, so there's a large group of people out there um, that don't know that they're at risk for the onset of these diseases. And we also firmly believe as a company that there's power in that relationship in your provider and your patients. So you might ask us, you know, there's 80 million people walking around with prediabetes. Why don't you get to them some other place? Um, but we firmly believe that the power of that relationship, uh, as Dr. Davis and her patients, that relationship that gets built over time, that that's where we're going to see um, real impact over time. Okay. So Brandy, let's talk about the actual platform you've built. Let's say I'm a patient. I come in, I talk to my doctor. Um, they identify that I am on the wrong track. I'm on track towards uh, type two diabetes, obesity. Uh, they have this tool at their disposal. Walk me through what that looks like, Brandy, for the patient themselves, just really practically. Absolutely. Yeah, so practically there's um, four main components to the product. So there's obviously, there's an assessment piece. And so we're asking questions about motivation 
We're asking questions about your self-reported um, health status, how you're feeling. We're asking about diagnosis of, of diabetes, hypertension, those kind of chronic illnesses. And then we're also doing a pre-diabetes risk um, survey as well. So there's a whole lot that comes into this assessment. It's a very quick process for the patient to do while they're in the waiting room on their smartphone. And then the second component is uh, what we've called um, triage or clinical decision support for the provider. So oftentimes what would happen is the providers in our pilot experiences would say, I don't know which patients to talk to about this and which patients not to. Um, and so we actually crunch together some clinical decision support recommendations, send those into the EHR uh, while the patient is in that visit. And then we also have a, another component, which are our own interventions. And so based on that web assessment, based on kind of the motivation level and interest of the patient, we then recommend our own interventions. Um, and we have two main interventions right now. One is called preventive counseling. Uh, we provide a facilitated uh, companion app experience with the patient and the provider to go through a series of visits around counseling on these things. And then also a remote monitoring feature as well for those pre-disease um, um, patients. Gotcha. Dr. Davis, how does this change this sort of day-to-day -day on the provider side uh, in terms of, I mean, Brandy, you, you, you touched on sort of the doctor understands the urgency and priority order of those patients better, but could you kind of spell out kind of what, what it looks like on the physician side? On the, on the physician side, you know, we have such busy days and uh, from the, from the, from the provider uh, perspective, we're busy doing what we're doing. And, and that is all day long, you know, full, full, full day of, you know, lots of things coming at you, including, um, you know, patient requests, provider requests, uh, lots of insurance requirements. So um, our goal was to make this platform seamless for the provider so as not to disrupt their day. And so that's the tech part, uh, the tech enabled piece of, of um, having the patients get these surveys done in the, in the waiting room or even pre-visit such that the providers are not spending time on it. Um, the uh, direct message support into the EHR such that the providers don't have to go log in to some other platform from you know, their core EMR that they're using all day long um, and um, making it easy for them so the providers don't have to figure out which patients will do this, which patients won't do this, which patients are motivated, which patients will be successful. We make that easy for them in this clinical decision support fee. So it's just this patient um, will be best suited for prevention counseling. This patient will be best suited for remote monitoring. Um, it takes a little bit of the guesswork out of it for the provider. Brandy, one question I have for you is how do you position, how do you uh, envision prevent scripts uh, within the larger sort of movement towards tech-enabled services for pre-diabetes and for obesity. We're in a cultural shift right now, and there are a lot, lot of headlines uh, about various companies trying to uh, tackle this issue in, in various ways. And so kind of understanding where you fit into that picture could be, could be helpful. Absolutely. And I think it would be great if we could have Dr. Davis respond as well, because she definitely sees the industry as a whole and as a futurist when it comes to that. From my perspective, uh, when we look at the, the kind of products that are on the market now, to your point, that are trying to, uh, you know, uh, have any kind of impact on these issues, we see a lot of focus on um, targeting customers like self, self-insured employers. Uh, we see a lot of targeting of insurance companies. We see um, a lot of targeting outside of the primary care clinic. And that's one of the things that really drives us is that the primary care doctor is getting left out of this conversation in so many ways. Um, they're not being able to uh, bill for these services because there's not a product available for them to kind of, as, as Dr. Davis, streamless, seamlessly put this into their practice. And so for us, it's about identifying, like we said, one of the core values for us is that we believe in the power of the relationship between the primary care provider and their patient. And so we're leveraging that. And that's how I see us fitting into the market right now. Um, I know Dr. Davis probably has even a larger view of that because she kind of sees the industry um, from that big picture view. You know, I'd love to hear that thought, Dr. Davis. Okay. Well, um, you know, it's, it's a race to value right now. And we, we already know that our primary care doctors are the highest value, lowest cost providers in our um, health provider ecosystem. So we want to help that provider provide even more value by 
taking these upstream at risk, early disease, pre-diabetes, pre-hypertensive patients and bringing them back from the brink of development of disease, that's where 75% of our healthcare system costs lie. So enabling the provider in primary care to generate revenue during that process of behavior change um, and helping them um, help their patients. Um, there's lots of implications later on for um, full risk, you know, uh, contracts for, for primary care providers. Um, right now we're working in, um, you know, various, uh, our bundle of CPT codes that providers can be, can be doing this now. Over time, um, this will be able to help them and help ACOs um, prove value and negotiate payment thereby. I want to shift focus for a minute away from sort of logistics and uh, business models and kind of personalize it for a bit sort of, uh, you know, Brandy, I understand that you recently uh, finished a term as the mayor of your city. Is that correct? I did. Um, and, you know, that is a position that uh, it just brings you right in touch with the needs of, uh, you know, intimately to the needs of, of your community. And I wonder for both of you, and Brandy, maybe you can start, uh, when you think about the, the, the faces of the people that you're trying to impact, um, you know, who comes to mind? Uh, you know, who really humanizes Prevent Scripts for you? Oh, I love that question. Thank you for asking me that. You know, it's interesting. My answer to your question directly is actually my dad, um, whom I obviously did not have to meet when I became the mayor. Um, so it's not directly connected to that, to the to being the mayor. But before I tell you about my dad, I'll tell you that um, my time as mayor definitely impacted me in so many more ways than I could have ever predicted when I ran for office. And I ran for office kind of half-heartedly thinking, um, this it sounds like an interesting experience. Could I even win? And then when I beat the incumbent and actually became the mayor, the second youngest mayor in my community, um, it started getting real. And right away, I knew that one of my main goals was to be focusing on the health of my community. Um, I have a background in public health. I have worked in free health clinics. I've done a lot of work in healthcare, And I knew that that was something I wanted to focus on. So that lens um, was kind of how I led the community. And it would probably take a different podcast episode to talk about all the ways that that kind of flushed itself out mm -hmm. um, and the challenges of getting your community to think about their own health. Um, so I'll say that probably was the thing that drove home even our mission even more for me was recognizing once again that most people on their own struggle to make healthy decisions because our environments are not facilitating them. And when you think about the one relationship you have that has that authority, it's the patient provider relationship. And there's a lot of um, opportunity there. But Logan, my dad is the person I think about. My dad was diagnosed two years ago, halfway through my term was diabetes. Um, he, I think is 65 now, maybe 66. And I, we, I knew he was having the onset um, from his symptoms and I had him go to one of my friends who's a primary care doctor. He immediately was diagnosed. So he was walking around with diabetes for a while before he was diagnosed. And every time we go to think about the user's experience, the patient's experience of this product, I use my dad as the avatar. I think about my dad two and a half years ago or three years ago. And if he would have been in a clinic with this program, could we, would we have stopped his onset or would we have delayed it even further? And his family history is so deep with circulation issues. Most of his siblings have lost limbs later in life. And so this is my dad and I don't have kids yet. And so I keep thinking about the grandfather that I want him to be. Mm -hmm. And it really makes this more imperative than ever. Dr. Davis, who, who humanizes this for you? Well, you know, Early on in business, um, you know, I had, I had patients that were using um, a variety of different consumer apps and, and finding success. Um, at the time, my 14-year-old daughter with type 1 diabetes was using very sophisticated technology, Dexcom, Omnipod, to track her blood sugar. And um, she has type 1. The, the pathology prevent scripts is interesting. side, we going into a dance class being 250 
and exercising for an hour and coming out of it an hour later at, at 120. And so that really hit home to me the, the ability for exercise to, to chew up sugar in your bloodstream, you know? And so I started to think about crossing that with my patients. And, you know, if we could just tell people when their blood sugar is 120 to walk for 30 minutes and recheck their blood sugar, you know, it, it, it'll be normal. And so we have a lot of those prompts built into our software for those early, early people. Um, and, um, we should be, be doing a similar thing um, for all these 80 million people that are walking around yeah. at risk. That's awesome. Um, Brandy, what does 2021 look like? Obviously 2020 was a, a crazy year for uh, health, digital health uh, adoption um, and a bit of an anomaly. As you look for the, to the future, uh, what do your current uh, partnerships and traction look like, and what are you what are you looking forward to for the for the year? Absolutely, I think this is going to be one of the most exciting years that we've had as a team um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, everything seems to have kind of come together at one time uh, for what we've been building. We are coming off of some really good pilot experiences out of 2019 that we've been working on this year, trying to get our version one product ready to go. We're knee deep in the middle of that development now. We raised, we've been bootstrapping um, for the last several years. We've been using our own money. We've, we raised our first round, our pre-seed round with some convertible note and some private equity. And so we're ready to start putting the resources behind this um, that we, uh, the timing is just good, I would say. Uh, so what our goal really is this year, um, we've also, let me just tell you this really quick before I tell you the goal. Uh, we've also taken a pretty aggressive uh, strategy around research. Uh, we want to make sure that we're building this product based on evidence. And so we've partnered with some University of Kentucky professors uh, to apply for NIH SBIR phase one funding. And we've also applied for SBIR phase one NSF funding as well um, to, to get our workflow um, improved. And that was exciting for us to get those applications in. We'll see those um, hopefully uh, come to fruition over the next several months. And then uh, we'll start to onboard our early adopter customers this year. That's the goal is to get our version one product completed and to start bringing on our early adopter customers um, and then go after um, hopefully a seed round at the end of the year so that we can make sure that um, as COVID is ending and we're seeing these providers get very interested in new ways of generating revenue, but also kind of new caring for their patients that will be ready to scale um, with their interest. Speaking of customers, Dr. Davis, um, what's the profile of an ideal partner for you right now? Uh, and maybe you could also just explain the best way to get in contact with you. This, uh, this really uh, hit home when we wrote this partnership, uh, wrote this uh, grant with University of Kentucky this year, um, because they, they sort of fit our exact customer profile. Well, of course, we want uh, partners that are batteries up, batteries included. So um, that, that high energy uh, can do it attitude in a partner. Um, we need partners that are focused on primary care. So um, either employed or uh, independent primary care groups. Uh, primary care focus groups and um, a focus on population health is another important filter for us um, such that um, there's commitment um, above and beyond um, the typical goals of primary care doctors right now such as readmission reduction medicine compliance so the those organizations that are going that next step and an upstream focus. Awesome. Well, Brandy, uh, Dr. Davis, I appreciate you taking the time to give me this update for your Startup Health TV. Um, more importantly, I appreciate just the passion and dedication that you've had building Prevent Scripts and really trying to bring better care to, to folks uh, in really high need. So, so Brandy, thank you very much. Dr. Davis, appreciate your time.